Good morning. For uh, for those of you who I don't who I don't know, my name is uh, Scott Keith. I've taught here a couple times, and it's my privilege this morning to introduce Dr. Montgomery. Uh, I've prepared here. <clears throat> Dr. Montgomery holds multiple doctorate degrees, uh, most notably from the University of Chicago, Strasburg University, and Cardiff University. Dr. Montgomery is considered by many to be the foremost living apologist for biblical Christianity. His road to Christianity was a rocky one, which is perhaps what motivated him to dedicate his life to the task of being an able apologist. To use C.S. Lewis's words, John Warwick Montgomery was brought over the threshold of the Christian faith, kicking and struggling. <laughs> the year was 1949, the place Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Herman J. Eckelman, a persistent engineering student, succeeded in goading Montgomery into religious discussions. Montgomery, a philosophy major disinterested in religion, found himself forced to consider seriously the claims of Jesus Christ in the New Testament in order to preserve big intellectual integrity. After no mean struggle, he acknowledged his rebellion against God and asked his forgiveness. I too at once had the opportunity to study under Dr. Montgomery for a brief time. In 1997, I traveled to Strasbourg, France to participate in what I think was the first annual International Academy of Apologetics, Evangelism, and Human Rights. Dr. Montgomery holds this event every year and has since that time training hundreds of men and women to be evangelists and apologists. Dr. Montgomery is the author of over 100 scholarly journal articles and more than 50 books, most of which are available at 1517 The Legacy Project. He is internationally regarded as a theologian, Christian apologist, and lawyer. He is truly the general of the Lutheran apologetics movement, and his boots are on the ground in Southern California. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Warwick Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Very well done. Very well done. Uh, the mention of the Academy in Strasbourg should connect with the brochure that is on the table in front of you. However, something very strange has occurred. We are completely full for the July session of this next year. Uh, why then am I distributing the leaflets? Because if you would like to do this program, which is the only Institute of Advanced Studies in Apologetics anywhere in the world, uh, my advice is to enroll for July of 2017, uh, the year of the anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, we have uh, social activities in connection with the program which will tie in with the anniversary of the Reformation. We are already taking applications for 2017, there are already two people signed up for 2017. We can only take 20 people on this program each year. And so uh, if this is of interest uh, to you, uh, you really ought to think about it as soon as possible. I know that sounds like, a, like quite a time ahead, uh, but uh, you really will have to do this. Uh, one of the <coughs> guest lecturers in 2017 is Dr. Erwin Lutzer. Uh, who, who has spent his career as the chief pastor at the Moody Church in Chicago. That's the church that was uh, uh, founded uh, by Dwight uh, Moody, the great 19th century evangelist. And uh, Lutzer is marvelous. Uh, we make sure that all of our lectures are, are stellar uh, speakers, uh, as well as being uh, competent in the field of apologetics. So, consider that seriously. All right. Uh, <clears throat> In Europe, uh, the Christmas season starts with Advent. In America, it starts about now. <laughs> and uh, for that reason, I should tell you about a Martin Luther doll that's going to be available for, uh, for, for Christmas. Uh, you wind it up and it just stands there. <laughs> We're going to be talking about Luther's stance uh, concerning the Holy Scriptures. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you the, uh, the conclusion of the detective story right away. This is so if you are uh, bored to tears by what I'm saying, you will have at least gotten the message right at the beginning. The Reformation stressed two principles, a formal principle and a substantive principle. These two principles are the heart of everything that took place during 
the Lutheran Reformation. The formal principle is the authority of Holy Scripture. The formal principle is you're going to get your religion from Holy Scripture or you're not going to get God's religion. And the substantive principle is the Gospel. The Gospel, uh, the center of Scripture, uh, that uh, God sent His Son to earth to take upon Himself the sins of a fallen race, to expiate those sins, and to rise again, uh, demonstrating that He had conquered death for every person who believes. Now, in theology, many of the most serious errors are made by trying to absorb one of these principles into the other. Thus, among the fundamentalists at the far right, the substantive principle, the gospel, is absorbed into the formal principle. What does that mean? It means that uh, in certain fundamentalist circles, uh, the Bible is treated as the whole show and everything in it is leveled out. Uh, there isn't the recognition that the primary purpose of Scripture is to point to Jesus Christ and salvation. So, in those circles you will have uh, Sunday school classes uh, in which uh, pins are given to the children for memorizing the names of all the fish in the book of Ezekiel. <laughs> right? And uh, uh, people in, in those circles will have a bumper sticker that says, Ruth was a Moabitess, <laughs> which is inerrantly true. She was not Chinese, no matter what you thought. Uh, uh, Ruth was a Moabitess. Uh, but the trouble is that in those circles, uh, <laughs> there is a, a non-recognition of the fact that uh, Scripture as Luther said, is about Christ alone and it needs to point always to Christ. Okay? Now, among the liberal element, the reverse happens. That is to say, the formal principle is swallowed up by the substantive principle. That means that for the liberals, the Bible isn't inerrant, the Bible simply uh, helps you to get to the Gospel, and the important thing is only the Gospel. Now, uh, I suppose in the, in the face of these two errors we might prefer the second, but the fact of the matter is that both of these errors are tragic for the Church. Because once you start questioning the authority of the Scriptures at any point, that can contaminate what the Bible says about Jesus Christ and about the Gospel. That is to say, you are in immediate danger of losing the Gospel itself huh, when you have lost the Scriptures. And this is why the Reformers, uh, at the head of them being uh, Dr. Luther, insisted on both of these principles and refused to allow one of them to swallow up the other. We're going to be talking about Luther's view of Scripture. Now, that's going to bore you to death because you already knew what his view of Scripture was, but uh, unfortunately I'm trained as a historian and I insist on using primary sources and you're going to have to listen to what Luther has to say about the Scriptures. And what you're going to discover is that Luther held that the Bible is authoritative, it is the final authority on all matters of faith and practice, it is completely reliable, uh, it contains no errors whatsoever, and uh, the so-called contradictions are able to be resolved, and if you can't resolve them, shut up and take the text as it stands anyway, because it's God's text, it isn't your text. And thirdly, the Holy Scripture is the clearest of all books. It is perspicuous, as they uh, use the terminology at the, at the time, uh, and so we have a Luther who maintains the authority, the inerrancy, and the clarity of Holy Writ. After we've talked about this, we're going to see that even in Lutheran circles, sad to say,
uh, there have been and there are theologians who are trying to swallow up the formal principle into the substantive principle, who are going away from the inerrancy of Scripture. And, of course, as long as these people are not in the Missouri Synod, uh, it won't bother you, because you would expect that of them, wouldn't you? Yes, yes. But I'm going to give you a couple of really troubling example, examples of problems that exist right at the moment. Hmm? Uh, that is to disturb you, because you, you're too relaxed. That's perfectly obvious. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then we're going to ask ourselves, why would good Lutherans, uh, people whose gross father, father was a Lutheran, why, why would they uh, do this? Why, why wouldn't they stick with Luther? And after we have seen what their rationale is uh, for, in effect, dumping the formal principle, uh, we're going to uh, look at why Luther considered this so terribly, terribly important. All right, we begin with a few quotations from Luther himself. And I begin, I said I was going to bore you to death, I'm, I'm going to begin with a quotation that you all know. This is Luther's statement at Worms. Before Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, his stand, his stand. Unless I am convinced by the testimonies of the Holy Scriptures or evident reason, uh, <clears throat> for I believe... Uh, for I believe in neither the Pope nor councils alone, since it has been established that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures that I have adduced, and my conscience has been taken captive by the word of God. And I am neither able nor willing to recant, since it is neither safe nor right to act against conscience. God help me. Amen. Now this critical, critical declaration uh, that brought the Reformation into existence. This critical uh, declaration has been badly misunderstood. Uh, it was considered in the 18th century, the period of the Enlightenment and the period of the Founding Fathers and so forth, as a great uh, affirmation of conscience. Everybody has a right to believe whatever he wants to believe. If you have listened to this quotation, that's not what Luther is saying at all. Yes, he mentions conscience. He says, I cannot act against conscience. But, he says, my conscience has been taken captive by the word of God. That is to say, one's religious position derives from scripture. It doesn't derive from conscience. Conscience appropriates it, huh? but the uh, the, the, the gospel, the, the truth, uh, resides in Holy Scripture. Says Luther, popes and councils have erred and contradicted themselves. Says he, I stick with Scripture. What is the obvious implication of this? That Scripture doesn't err or contradict itself. That at the very beginning point of the Reformation. Other quotations from Luther on the same subject. It is impossible for Scripture to contradict itself except at the hands of senseless and hardened hypocrites. This is a typically mild statement of the Reformer. <laughs> but in the hands of those who are godly, uh, it gives testimony to the Lord. Therefore, see to it that you reconcile Scripture. Which as, you, which, which, as you say, he's writing to a particular person, uh, contradicts itself. I shall stay with the author of Scripture. Okay? Luther says, if you think it contradicts itself, you're wrong. Huh? And you might fall into that uh, delightful category of being a senseless and hardened hypocrite. Hmm. In the large catechism, we have Luther saying again and again, God does not lie or deceive. And at least twice, Luther quotes St. Augustine in the 5th century, uh, where Augustine said, I have learned to ascribe uh, a, a revelation only to the Holy Scriptures. I am firmly convinced that none of those writers have erred. 
And Luther goes on and says, all others I read in such a way that I do not consider what they say to be the truth unless, it, unless they can prove it to me by Holy Scripture. Right. Uh, that incidentally can, can show you that this notion of, of Scripture being entirely reliable is not something that turned up at the time of the Reformation. This has been maintained by the historic church through its entire history. Augustine in the 5th century is saying exactly the same thing, and Luther quotes him because of that. And the saints were subject to error in their writings and to sin in their lives. Scripture cannot err. Right? That's Luther on the abuse of the Mass. And he says, we know that God does not lie. My neighbor and I, in short, all men, uh, may err and deceive, but God's word cannot err. Yes. Uh, and uh, you, you, you would think that that would be enough, uh, but it, it isn't. Uh, it's necessary for me to give you a couple more quotations along the same line. But, but they are so thrilling that you won't mind in the least. <laughs> if I can possibly read in this strange light here. Uh, <sighs> All right. I have learned to ascribe the honor of infallibility only to those books that are accepted as canonical, that are genuine books of the Bible. I am profoundly convinced that none of these writers has erred. All other writers, uh, however, uh, they may have distinguished themselves uh, in holiness or doctrine, I read in this way. I evaluate what they say not on the basis that they themselves believe such a thing is true, but insofar as they are able to convince me uh, by the authority of the canonical books or by clear reason. Pretty strong, pretty strong. And on the matter of the clear, oh, by the way, by the way, that passage uh, that I've just uh, read to you is included in the uh, last of the great Lutheran confessions, uh, the formula of Concord in the Solid Declaration, the preface to the Solid Declaration, uh, the, the, uh, the writers say uh, that Luther explicitly made the distinction between uh, divine and human writings. And then that very passage is quoted. So uh, people who are uh, Lutheran uh, church members are committed to this kind of thing. What about the matter of the clarity of Scripture? Luther uh, was in a uh, powerful argument with the great Renaissance humanist Erasmus. Uh, Erasmus did a work uh, entitled Free Will, Free Will, arguing in favor of the Roman Catholic view that people have enough free will to make the kind of decision that will take them into, into God's presence. Uh, Luther, however, one of his favorite statements was, you've got enough free will to go to hell. <laughs> All right? What you don't have is enough free will to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps to heaven. Uh, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in the course of this debate uh, in writing uh, between uh, Luther, who did a work entitled The Bondage of the Will, and Erasmus, uh, the question of whether Scripture could be regarded as clear uh, came up. And so that was a big part of the debate. Uh, and uh, Luther's position was that it did not need uh, a, a church body to interpret it for you. The Scripture was so clear that it would make sense by itself. And this is what he says in, in connection with this debate with Erasmus. The notion that scripture, that in Scripture some things are recondite and all is not plain was spread by the godless sophists uh, uh, whom you now echo, Erasmus. These people have never yet uh, cited a single item to prove their crazy view, nor can they. And Satan has used these unsubstantiated uh, specters uh, to scare off people from reading the sacred text uh, and, to destroy, um, uh, and to destroy all sense of its value, so as to ensure that his own brand of poisonous philosophy reigns supreme in the church. I certainly grant that many passages in Scripture are obscure and hard to elucidate. But that is due not to the exalted nature of the subject, 
but to our own linguistic and grammatical ignorance. Who will maintain that the town fountain does not stand in the light because the people down some alley cannot see it, while everyone in the town square can see it? Luther's point here is that when we have trouble understanding the scripture, it's our fault, it's not the fault of the text. Uh, it's like a peasant uh, in an alley saying there isn't any town fountain. He's blocked himself off from a view of the town fountain. The problem is not the fountain. The problem is uh, the peasant. Uh, and by that same token, it is e essential for people to shelve their presuppositions, their prejudices, uh, keep their big mouths shut, and simply listen to what the text is saying. And then scripture turns out to be, as Luther says, the clearest of all books. All right. Uh, now, uh, if that's Luther's view, uh, why would anyone, uh, who considers himself Lutheran at least, uh, take a different view? Well, one reason that's been given of for, for, for years, centuries maybe, uh, is that uh, Luther had some trouble with certain books of the New Testament. He did not consider certain books canonical. He didn't think that certain books ought to go into the New Testament. Now one needs to point out right away that that was early in Luther's career, and as he, uh, as uh, different editions of his translation of the Bible into German were published, uh, he did a preface at each of these, and if you read these prefaces, he becomes less and less uh, critical uh, as time goes on, until the edition of uh, his translation, which was done just before his death, doesn't suggest that these books are, are, are non-canonical. It, it shows that Luther is still a bit uncomfortable with them, but he certainly is not throwing them out of the Bible. And he translated them, he included them uh, in the Bible, just as we have it today. Now, uh, <clears throat> does this mean that Luther uh, didn't really believe in inerrancy. Hardly. This is not the same issue. Hmm? Uh, these are two different breeds of cat. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, the, Luther has said again and again, if the book is canonical, if it's properly part of scripture, then it's inerrant. It's without error and you must resolve the contradictions uh, and, and not accept them as such. Okay, uh, why though did Luther have some problems with certain books? Well, uh, the major two books with, with which he had problems were the, uh, the Epistle of James, Book of James, and the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation. What bothered Luther about James was that he thought that James was contradicting Paul on the issue of salvation by grace alone through faith. Uh, that James was presenting, uh, in some sense, a works uh, uh, route to salvation. Now, of course, James isn't doing that at all. He's simply using the term faith in a different sense uh, from, the, from the sense in which Paul uses it. Uh, and Luther eventually saw that as a, as a possibility. As far as the book of Revelation, uh, it, it, uh, Luther was bothered by all of this apocalyptic stuff. And then he was helped greatly when someone pointed out that among these apocalyptic images is the one of the, of the whore that sitteth on the seven hills. Obviously the Pope. <laughs> and suddenly Luther saw the, the revelatory value uh, of, of the book of Revelation. Right. Now, suppose, suppose I were to come here in my prophet's robe um, with a big, fat, beautifully bound Bible. And I say to you, do you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture? And you say, yes, yes, yes. I say, fine. Is this inerrant? And I pass my, my, my Bible to you. And you look at it and you open it up. And in the middle is bound the Santa Ana telephone directory. <laughs> you say, I can't affirm the inerrancy of this. I say, ha ha, caught you. You don't believe in inerrancy, do you? You see the point? Uh, if a book shouldn't be in Scripture, then of course one wouldn't consider it inerrant. 
Uh, if Luther had a problem, the problem was in uh, not recognizing uh, the, uh, the canonicity, the proper place in Scripture of every single book of the New Testament. Uh, you know, that came up as a new question at the time of the Reformation. The early church uh, brought into the Bible, uh, into the New Testament, those books that had apostolic authorship. That's the criterion. A book had to be written by an apostle or it had to derive from apostolic circles so that the apostles could check the accuracy of it. This was in terms of Jesus' statement, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and will bring to your remembrance every single thing that I have told you. That's why the church collected the books that are in our New Testament. Well, the Roman Catholic Church said, ha, the church has determined what the Bible is. And Luther, of course, couldn't accept that. The scripture has to criticize scripture, uh, has to criticize the church, not the other way around. And so the issues of canonicity came up again. But ultimately, uh, the uh, judgment of the early church was confirmed. These books are exactly the books that we ought to have in the New Testament. So that is no argument on any level against Luther's view of the inerrancy of scripture. But why, why today are there Lutheran theologians uh, who maintain a position that is not that of Luther's? Uh, why do they do this? And what exactly is their position? Well, I'm going to, uh, I've been quoting from my book, God's Inerrant Word, which is available out there on the table, I am told, and also The Crisis in Lutheran Theology. The book, The Crisis in Lutheran Theology, uh, dealt with a controversy in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod itself. And that controversy is now known as the Seminex controversy. It goes back to the 1970s, late 60s and 1970s, and uh, in this controversy, faculty members at the Concordia Seminary St. Louis argued that it's unimportant whether there are errors and contradictions in the Bible. The important thing is that the Bible presents the gospel. In other words, they absorbed the formal principle into the substantive principle. And uh, they thought that they could convince the church of this. Uh, they were not able to do this. Uh, in part, this was due to a very strange periodical with an even stranger editor. Uh, it was called Lutheran News at that time. Now it's called Christian News. And the editor, Herman John Otten. And Otten is crazier than a March Hare. There is no, <laughs> there is no question about this. He should be living in a rubber room. But he saw clearly that this viewpoint of these professors was contrary to the Lutheran confessions, contrary to the position of Luther himself, and would bring down the gospel. And so he created an incredible fuss. Uh, he did this on a popular level. Uh, I, I did it on a scholarly level by way of this book, uh, which was very, very widely read. And ultimately, the professors <clears throat> at the seminary who maintained the deviant view I'm, I'm going to be talking about, uh, they marched out of the seminary with banners to create the seminary in exile, seminex, seminary in exile. Well, it only lasted about 10 years. It, it dried up and blew away, uh, all right, uh, as, as did mo most of these people, and the seminary returned to a proper Lutheran position. Um, I'm going to read you a few quotations, very short ones in this case, uh, quotations from uh, people who were involved in that controversy. And uh, today, the, uh, uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America uh, maintains the viewpoint that these Seminex people uh, were trying to uh, foist onto the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, indeed, uh, those professors uh, invariably ended up in, in the uh, uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America or uh, its, its predecessor bodies that folded into it uh, at a later time. Well, one of the professors, and I, I studied under him at the uh, Chicago Lutheran Theological Seminary, was Joseph Sittler. And Sittler has this to say, <laughs> all verbal forms, all means of communication through speech prove too weak for the uh, massive bestowal of revelation. 
we must ask uh, we must ask after the word of God in the same way faith asks after Jesus Christ. That is to say, the word of God uh, becomes word of God for us. To assert the inerrancy of the text of Scripture is to elevate it to a normative position, uh, and this is an arbitrary theological construction. Uh, this uh, simply means that the, uh, the text of, of Scripture is, is not to be regarded as inerrant. We don't want to think of it that way. It must become the Word of God for us, and it becomes the Word of God as we have a personal experience with the, the, the Christ of Scripture, Joseph Sittler. And I could quote Abling, who was a German theologian. Incidentally, most of those professors uh, that <clears throat> created the fuss in the Seminex business had studied under German uh, theologians in Germany. And in Germany, the faculties of theology are state faculties. And there is no doctrinal requirement connected with them at all. At the present time, there are two or three theology professors in Germany who are atheists. All right? Which seems a little bizarre. It's sort of like teaching law if you don't believe in crime, uh, or, or teaching medicine and you don't think there are any germs. You know, it's that sort of thing. But uh, that is, in fact, the case. Now, uh, why did those uh, professors take such a viewpoint? Well, it was the position of their professors, and uh, there's nothing like a German graduate education which is hopelessly authoritarian. Uh, it is said, for example, of, of Kant that a student said, but the facts disagree with you. And Kant said, then the facts be hanged. Uh, the same story is told of Hegel, so it's obviously apocryphal, but it does tell you something about German graduate education. Uh, it's fascinating that as a person rises from aus ordentlicher professor to ordentlicher professor uh, uh, up the, the, the pecking order, uh, the number of footnotes in his scholarly articles diminishes proportionately. The more authoritative the professor becomes, uh, the less he feels he has to back up what he says, because he is becoming the grand poobah. And as the grand poobah, he doesn't have to justify what he says, he just says it. And this, of course, frightened the daylights out of American students, the theology students from the Missouri Synod and other places. And, and off they went uh, and, uh, and uh, usually swallowed this stuff hook, line, and sinker. But what led theologians to that kind of view of scripture? The answer is a phenomenon called higher criticism. Higher criticism. Now, you are not going to know what that is, but I'm going to explain this in appalling detail so that you will understand it. One doesn't have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. We don't have anything that Moses signed. We don't have anything that any of the apostles signed. These things are called the autographs, huh? the things actually written by the, by the writers. We don't have any of them. Now you say, my, my heavens, my heavens. Uh, so immediately to, uh, to calm you down, we don't have the autographs of any works of classical antiquity. We don't have anything signed by Cicero uh, or, or uh, uh, Aristotle at all. Therefore, a field uh, comes into existence called lower or textual criticism. The lower or textual critic takes the surviving manuscripts and copies of manuscripts uh, and carefully examines them in order to try to get back to the best text possible, the text that is the closest to what would have been uh, the result if we had the autographs. All right? And that is a, a, a careful scientific activity. And it produces, in the case of the New Testament, uh, a critical edition of the Greek text. And uh, that text is based upon the very best manuscript sources. In general, the 
best Greek texts are Codex Sinaiticus, the Sinai Codex, uh, and Codex Vaticanus, the Vatican Codex. These are fourth century, and they contain the uh, complete uh, four Gospels. Okay? Now, earlier than that, you have some quotations, you have some translations into Latin of, of, of fragments, uh, and the uh, textual critic goes to work on this stuff in order to arrive at, at a text. And where there are significant variations, where there are uh, manuscripts that aren't as good but are worth mentioning, they will go into footnotes. All right? Now, uh, the fascinating thing about this is that the first uh, critical edition, as it were, of the Greek New Testament was done by Erasmus, whom we've mentioned, and Luther used that Greek uh, text of the New Testament in order to produce his German translation. Uh, and if you look at that German translation, or if you look at the King James Bible, which is also based on Erasmus' text, that's called the Textus Receptus, the received text, if you look at this, and you compare it with any modern translation, one that was done last week, let us say, the overlap is about 97%. That is to say, <laughs> with all of the manuscripts that we have found in intervening centuries, the, the textual differences are trivial. They are very, very minor. And we have a solid text, and as we move back in time, the number of textual problems diminishes. Now, we don't have the autographs, but surely the reasonable way to look at this is that if the errors and problems disappear as we move back, if we were able to get back another hundred years, uh, any existing problems would disappear. It certainly is, would not be very rational to think that it's like this and then uh, you've got a, a hideous mess uh, uh, in, the, in the area where we don't have manuscript materials. All right, that's lower textual criticism. Why is it called lower? Well, it's called lower because coming on the scene in the 19th century were people who called themselves higher critics, higher critics. Uh, these people said, all right, you've done a good job, you lower critics, but we can take this thing to a higher level or to a deeper level. We're going to read the results, and if we find stylistic changes, changes in vocabulary, uh, changes in organization, uh, this kind of thing within the best texts, that's going to tell us that actually there were sub-documents. There were documents that were later pasted together and edited to produce what the lower critic has discovered. Okay? Now, uh, <clears throat> this began obviously in Germany, obviously. Uh, uh, three, uh, uh, three Old Testament scholars, Graf, Kienen, und Wellhausen, uh, in the 19th century, uh, went to work on the first five books of the Bible, on the Pentateuch. And uh, they concluded uh, that uh, these were not written by Moses. They were the product of four sub-documents that were clumsily pasted together by editors in the 10th century. Uh, there was the, the J document that uh, used the word Yahweh, uh, or Jehovah for God. There was the E document that used Elohim for God, the general Hebrew word for God. There was the legal stuff, the Deuteronomic, the D stuff. And then there was the priestly stuff, the P. So this is the J-E-P-D theory. By the time I was in theological seminary, Morgan Stern at Hebrew Union College had gotten up to dividing the K document into K and K sub 1. What was the problem here? Nobody could agree as to these stylistic differences uh, or vocabulary changes or structural alterations, this kind of thing, and nobody ever found any of the sub documents. There was an attempt made to produce the so called polyglot Bible. <laughs> Uh, which would show these different alleged strands in different colors. 
It was never published because they couldn't uh, agree uh, as to where one strand uh, stopped and another one began. Today, the people who do this kind of thing are members of the so-called Jesus Seminar, and they've solved this by voting. They use colored balls, and they do this with the New Testament. And so uh, you, you vote on whether a phrase really came from Jesus, whether it probably might have come from Jesus, probably not, or, or certainly not. Uh, and uh, what you have to do is to get a subscription uh, to this because you, you want to find out every month what Jesus actually said, if he, if, if, if he said anything. Now, <laughs> what uh, is the problem with this kind of thing? The problem is that, first of all, there are no sub-documents. In the case of the New Testament, we have nothing earlier than the four Gospels as we find them, or quotations that are from the four Gospels. We, we have no strands of material that could have been woven into the Gospels by the early church to reflect the different theologies of the early church, as it's often put. We have none of that. So, the whole thing is subjective. The whole thing is subjective. The critic reads the text as given by the lower critic, and he says, if I had written this, I would have maintained a more consistent style, and I would not have altered the vocabulary the way it appears to be altered. Therefore, this text must derive from a combination of materials. Listen, listen, all that says is that if the critic had been chosen to write the Bible, he would have not done it that way. That's why God didn't choose higher critics to write the Bible. <laughs> like Frank Sinatra, God wanted to do it his way. <laughs> and style is never a sufficient ground for authorship or to, to establish sources. If you read part one and part two of Goethe's Faust, you would never believe they were written by the same person. They were written years apart, just as the Gospel of John and the Apocalypse, the Revelation of St. John, were written years apart. Uh, consider your own work. If you are in school, you, you, you do term papers. If somebody compared your love letters with your term papers, I don't think that they would believe they were written by the same person. Um, if they do seem to be the same, either you're never going to get a degree or you're never going to get married, uh, <laughs> or both. Uh, the higher criticism has been tried in other academic areas. It was tried in Ugaritic studies, that's a cognate Near Eastern language ancient Near Eastern language. And the greatest authority in that field, Cyrus Gordon, said, finally, if we don't stop this, we're going to destroy Ugaritic literature. It's all going to fall into subjectivity. When I was at Cornell as an undergraduate majoring in philosophy and classics, I had a, a professor of Latin, a real wag, uh, uh, Harry Kaplan. And Kaplan said, for 75 years, we've been using this approach to try to find the real authors of the Iliad and the Odyssey. After 75 years, we've come to the following conclusion. If the Iliad and the Odyssey were not written by Homer, uh, they were written by someone of the same name who lived about the same time. <laughs> but in biblical scholarship, in, in quotation marks, in, in the biblical field, uh, liberal biblical scholars in the mainline denominations and in the mainline theological seminaries have swallowed higher criticism hook, line, and sinker. Uh, they, for them, that theory is actually more inerrant by a long shot than the text of Holy Scripture. And if you uh, are convinced that that kind of method is all right, you are certainly not going to take the text as we have it as necessarily authoritative or reliable or clear. Now, uh, as a result of that very, very poor uh, academic technique, uh, you will go to the public library and you will get 
for example, the interpreter's Bible. You'll take the interpreter's Bible off the shelf. And all the way through, there are these conjectures about what the real sources of the material are. And what, the, uh, what the, the, the encyclopedia doesn't tell you is that this, this isn't based on any sources. It isn't based upon any actual manuscript evidence whatsoever. So we are really in exactly the same position Luther was. We have exactly the same Bible. I mean, there's some minor variations, but we're, we've got the same Bible. And uh, therefore, the question uh, comes to us, just as it did to him, how valuable is this scripture? Now, you say, well, of course, among people in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, you would expect them to jump on this bandwagon. Thank goodness, thank goodness we're perfect in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and, and there is no possible uh, chance that something like that would occur. Well, uh, for one thing, uh, uh, absorb a little history. The Seminex controversy was very serious. It was on the knife edge as to whether the major seminary of uh, our church body was going to go down the drain uh, along with the mainline theological seminaries, and therefore that the denomination would follow the same route. It, it was nip and tuck. This was not an easy victory. In fact, it was by divine providence that these people marched out uh, to form Seminex. It would have taken a generation to deal with each one of them through heresy trials, and there would have been ghastly publicity and all this and that. They did the Missouri Synod the greatest favor possible by getting the heck out of the Missouri Synod. Okay? Well, that should suggest that original sin even applies within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. I know how hard that is for you to realize. Uh, and unfortunately, right at the present moment, we are facing, or we will be facing, apparently, uh, a, a problem that is directly analogous to the problem of Seminex. So, get ready for this. The New Testament Department, and these problems invariably start in the New Testament Department. The New Testament Department at Concordia Seminary St. Louis has a department head and a professor, both of whom studied under the same doctoral advisor. And indeed, both of them have contributed to a festschrift, a commemorative volume, for this, this gentleman. Uh, this uh, gentleman, the, the professor uh, under whom they studied, uh, uh, is a lower critic, and uh, a textual critic, and therefore you would think everything is sweetness and light. But the fact is that this gentleman, the, the professor uh, under whom they studied, has developed a new theory of textual criticism. And the theory is this, that uh, you don't have to go along with the major textual authorities, as long as there is a variety of textual possibility, as long as there are manuscripts that can support various readings, then you can make a decision as to the reading according to the internal criteria of the text. That is, according to your subjective reading of the text. Now, if you think about that for a moment, you will see that that amounts to the same kind of thing that the higher critics were saying. The higher critics say that you can get behind the existing text uh, and, and you can rely upon these <laughs> non-existent materials. Uh, in this case, uh, there isn't any uh, reliance on non-existing materials. Uh, instead, the professor is saying, as long as there are some variations available, that means you are not compelled to follow the majority readings of the text, and you can, you can look at the, at the different texts available to you, and you can choose among them according to what will fit a, a literary scheme more effectively. Now, one of the two professors at Concordia St. Louis has just published an article in which he argues that the Magnificat was not spoken by Mary, but was spoken by Elizabeth. Now, that's not a doctrinal issue. If someone had wandered in off the street, uh, the mailman, 
and had uttered the Magnificat, and that had been recorded, no one would feel uh, uncomfortable with this. I mean, anybody could have could have done. But the the majority text, not just the majority text, just about every text worth anything that we have attributes the Magnificat to Mary. That is true of Codex uh, Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, the two best Greek texts that we have. And uh, so th what this professor does is to go back and he finds a, a church father, Origen, Origen, who incidentally was ultimately condemned for heresy, but, but, but Origen uh, questioned whether it might be Elizabeth. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, if you take uh, Irenaeus, the church father Irenae Irenaeus, who's very reliable, there are, two, uh, there are two places where this is referred to, and one of them, uh, Irenaeus says it's Mary, and in the other he appears to be saying it's Elizabeth. So that evidence is divided. And there are uh, some Latin translations, but not the Vulgate, uh, some questionable marginal Latin translations that mention Elizabeth. So the professor says, well, uh, this, we've got to determine this by the internal uh, uh, a consistency of the text. And I read you just one sentence which will make you sick. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Sickness is about to arrive. <laughs> Were the Magnificat placed on the lips of Mary, it would be the only time she verbalizes praise to the Lord. Such a verbalization would not be consistent with her characterization elsewhere in Luke. The professor is saying, Magnificat is in Luke, if Mary said this, that would be the only time that she praised the Lord like that. And therefore, it would be so much better from a literary standpoint to, to have Elizabeth say it. What does this presuppose? It presupposes that the text of Luke and other biblical texts are not attempting to give you historical facts. Instead, they are literary attempts to provide a really effective Funsville story. And the story would be better if Elizabeth did the Magnificat. Now, Luke begins his gospel by saying, I have followed all things closely from the beginning. I am giving you the straight scoop on exactly what actually happened. People have compared this with, with uh, 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 German uh, historians uh, of the 19th century uh, who, uh, who were so concerned to have every jot and tittle correct, uh, secular historians. There, there's no doubt about the fact that Luke is saying at the beginning of his gospel, I am telling you what actually happened. But what this professor is doing is saying, ah, what Luke is doing is creating a, a narrative. He's creating a story. And therefore, uh, if we, uh, if we uh, uh, read this, we're going to see more effective ways that material could be uh, handled as long as there are some textual readings that would allow us to do this. Okay? The danger of this is absolutely staggering. The same professor has done an article in which he talks about the plastic text of the Bible. There isn't any solid text. It's plastic. Why? Because there's always a possibility of finding new manuscripts, right? And there's always a possibility of interpreting manuscripts differently. And says he, uh, we can still hold to the Bible. We hold to the Bible because the Holy Spirit works in the church and the church puts its stamp of approval on the current text. What does that do? It, of course, makes the locus of authority the church and not the scripture. If Luther had held that, there never could have been a reformation, for heaven's sake. Uh, for, for Luther, the text judges the church. The church does not judge the text. And anyway, for goodness sake, uh, the, as we said earlier, uh, the, the, the variations uh, across the centuries are, are trivial, are trivial. Uh, anybody from the 17th century reading a, a current translation of the Bible uh, would not be surprised by anything he came across. So the text isn't plastic. You know, plasticity lies in the kind of, of mental attitude uh, of anybody who gets a, a, a notion like this. Now, <clears throat> if that wasn't bad enough, I am going to read you a statement by 
that same gentleman, who, by the way, is, is supported by his uh, department head. They both studied under the same person. Uh, I understand that President Harrison has met with these people and met with the president of the seminary. And, uh, the, and the, the gentleman I'm talking about is supposed to have revised the plastic text article. That was eight months ago. No one has seen it. Everybody has tried to get a hold of it. I don't think it was ever revised. But in any case, listen, listen, uh, cancer surgery. Huh? If someone has cancer, you cut it out as fast as possible. And if this kind of thing is going on, you cut it out as fast as possible. These things only get worse. They do not get better. Huh? The entropy, if you're into physics, uh, think of this as theological entropy. Huh? Things are going down. They aren't evolving and getting better. Anyway, listen to this. This is the professor I'm referring to. If you want to rip Romans 15 and 16 out of my Bible, I can live with that. If you want Hebrews, James, Revelation torn out too, I can live with that. If you force me to look only at P46, that's one of the papyrus fragments, uh, I can live with that. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot he could live with. I won't go through all of that. Uh, you get the idea? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, uh, if, if I have only a manuscript uh, uh, that is uh, uh, corrupted, corrupted, uh, or to use Luther's, uh, if to use Luther's words, it preaches Christ, there is no problem. If they preach Christ, if the text, whatever it happens to be, preaches Christ, uh, they are of the Spirit. For preaching Christ is the Spirit's work. And if they preach Christ, they are apostolic. For the apostle can speak nothing other than what he has been sent to speak. So, apostles, no matter who they are, even one who has been aborted like St. Paul, uh, who once persecuted the church, preach the death and resurrection of Christ. I can live without a perfect Bible. I can live without a perfect Bible. I cannot live without God raising Jesus from the dead. Okay? On the other hand, force me to read only the Gospel of Thomas. I cannot live with that. That's one of the Gnostic Gospels, late second century, right? Or the Koran or the Book of Mormon, not because they are not inerrant or perfect, or even, uh, or, or, or even human, but because there is no gospel. There is no new life in Christ." Unquote. What, the, what the professor is saying here is, I don't need an inerrant Bible. All I need is a book that preaches Christ. And if it preaches Christ, it's apostolic. Hmm? Uh, and his reason for rejecting these cultic and uh, non-Christian religious texts uh, isn't that they're false, it's that they don't preach Christ. Uh, the, 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 the danger of this, of course, is, is simply uh, overwhelming. This is the absorption of the formal principle, Holy Scripture, into uh, the substantive principle. Uh, I called this at the time of the Seminex controversy, Gospel reductionism. Gospel reductionism, because it reduces the entire scripture only to the straight statement of the gospel. And, and you know, it, it, isn't it strange that the Lord would have cost the American Bible Society so much money in the printing of 66 books when if all that's important is, is the gospel, uh, he didn't just provide that on the back of a postcard. And uh, it would have saved uh, an immense amount of money in the printing of, of, of biblical texts. Okay, now uh, notice the difference between what I'm talking about and what I've been describing. Suppose that I uh, deliver, uh, I go and I record funeral elegies, funeral elegies, right? Uh, you know, at, at some of these awful uh, 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 pagan funerals, uh, you have um, the, the relatives and friends of the deceased and each one gets up and says, oh, wasn't he wonderful? He's just the nicest person in the world. Yes, he drank himself to death, but it was high quality liquor, <laughs> you know, you know and, and so forth. Now, uh, uh, suppose I go to one of these awful occasions and I record the elegies as they are presented. And then later on, somebody like this professor, or his professor, looks at this result and says, you know, the order of elegies would have been so much more effective from a literary standpoint 
if the third elegy had been presented first, and the second elegy had been presented fifth, and so forth. So there's a, a realignment of this stuff. And the result undoubtedly would have been better from a literary standpoint. There's just one problem with it. That's not what we were doing. We were recording what actually happened. Now, the scripture is recording what actually happened. <clears throat> and therefore, if you think that on the basis of a few trivial manuscript variants, you can choose something that is better from a literary standpoint, forget it. Forget it. You're going to be modifying what actually happened, and you're therefore going to be modifying Revelation. It is vitally important that we stick with what God does. He has forgotten more about textual criticism than you or I will ever know, and therefore it would be a wise idea, in my view, to stick with him. I am going to conclude now with a quotation from Luther. Of course I am. How could I do otherwise? <laughs> I cannot do otherwise, here I st yes, all right. <laughs> this is from Luther's commentary on John 3.16, John 3.16, all right? If a different way to heaven existed, no doubt God would have recorded it, but there is no other way. Therefore, let us cling to these words, firmly place and rest our hearts upon them. Uh, close our eyes and say, although I had the merit of all the saints, the holiness and purity of all virgins, and the piety of St. Peter himself, I would still consider my attainment nothing. Rather, I must have a different foundation to build on, namely, these words God has given. His son uh, has given. His son so that... Who, uh, Darren, may I... That, confounded lighting. Uh, rather, I must have a different foundation to build on, namely these words. God has given his Son so that whoever believes in him whom the, Father, uh, whom the Father's love uh, has sent shall be saved. And you must confidently insist that you will be preserved and you must boldly take your stand on his words, which no devil, hell, or death can suppress. Therefore, no matter what happens, you should be saying, this is God's word. This is my rock and my anchor. On it I rely and it remains. Where, where it remains, I too remain. Where it goes, I go as well. The word must stand and God cannot lie. The reason that the inerrancy of scripture was so important for Luther is simply this. We are factually sinners. We are factually on the way to hell on the basis of our selfishness. That is a historical and personal fact. If the Bible can't be relied upon as it stands, the salvation that it offers is not going to be able to touch our condition. We are not in a story and looking for the ideal literary presentation. We are sinners desperately in need of a factual salvation. And the factual salvation has got to be embedded in the scripture that is factually reliable. That's why this issue is so important. And I uh, pray uh, that this problem will be resolved uh, as the Seminex problem was years ago. All right. Uh, I, I believe we've got to terminate right at this point. Sorry there isn't time for questions. Uh, because uh, you have five minutes uh, to make the service. <laughs>